I know I'm supposed to say Happy New Year, but in the tradition of trading places, I will say Merry New Year and welcome to the 24 edition of the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with information and guidance that empowers you so you can make better financial decisions throughout 24. And we're back and ready to talk about how you can save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. Up first, you want to talk about what's becoming a really ugly ripoff again? Your cell phone bill. Rates are rising. New data shows they're going up at twice the rate of inflation in the U.S. economy. This is after they went down year after year after year. I've got a lot of ideas to help you save. I'm also going to tell you what to expect this year if you're worried about paying tax bills on money you've received through Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, or Big Bad Zell. I'm going to tell you what you need to know coming up later in this podcast. So cell phone bills are on the march up. And anybody who studied economics in college could absolutely say, of course they've gone up because we've gone from four national cell phone providers to three. And so the three that remain have pushed rates higher and higher and higher. And Verizon has been most public about it, but I'd say the sneakiest with the price increases has been T-Mobile that, in my opinion, has violated the agreement they reached with the feds under antitrust grounds to be able to extinguish the Sprint brand by absorbing it into T-Mobile. So when we went to, from four to three, the marketplace responded with ugliness for your and my wallet. Now, there is a fourth competitor that is supposed to already be viable in the marketplace but has not really made it yet, and that's Boost. And we'll see if Boost ever gives a booster shot to competition in the cell phone market. So far, they've been MIA on making a difference in the marketplace. But that was part of the whole deal was that if Sprint went away, that there would be a fourth national player, and we're still waiting, waiting, waiting. So when you refer to national players, you're talking about companies that own uh, you know, cellular licenses for various frequencies, and cell phone companies don't own towers anymore. They lease space on towers from companies that specialize in that. But what uh, Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T do is they lease tower spots all over America, and where they don't have tower spots, they then lease um, capacity from others to be able to show those maps of the United States where they show coverage pretty much everywhere except parts of the mountain states where you can't get a signal if your life depended on it. But the, the big three are marketing behemoths. You know, my TV is going off next month because I only watch TV during football season. And as soon as the Super Bowl happens in February, I'm done with TV till the following September. But I can tell you, watching football, which is my life, that you see commercial after commercial after commercial for two product categories today. Used to be it was beer. You saw beer commercials all the time. Nope, now... It's AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, and then it's the insurance ads. I mean, my goodness, if the auto and property, property insurance insurers didn't buy all those ads, think how much less our rates could be for insurance. But they're trying to move market share, and they do all these cute things where they try to humanize a very... Uh, <laughs> very dry industry, and the cell phone ads are all trying to defensively hold on to market share, 
or they're trying to move market share. In particular, I think about how AT&T does its ads, which are all about trying to retain their existing customers and not have them migrate to someone else. But the reality is my message for you is you should be looking to migrate to someone else. There are any of a number of discounters that buy, there's enormous excess capacity on those towers. They buy it, and they buy it either on the network operation of Verizon, T-Mobile, or AT&T, or each of these companies also have their own discount brands. Verizon has more than anybody, and they're owned by Verizon, but you wouldn't know it because they market under a bunch of different names, all at lower price points than being with Verizon. Again, AT&T, T-Mobile, same thing. And so you look at where the growth is in the cell phone industry, it's all with these lower price point providers that can cut your cell phone bill by a very, very, very large amount. I'm talking without even breaking a sweat, You can cut your cell phone bill in half by looking at the discounters. We devote a lot of resources on Clark.com to reviewing these, let's call them off-brand cell phone providers. And you can check out our reviews. And if there's a network you're on you're really comfortable with, read the reviews of ones that we have reviewed that are on that network. Or if you're not really worried about which one of the big three networks you're on, just look at the reviews for the type of services you're looking for and how much data you need, whether it's unlimited or a limited cap. I've been testing one we've not tested before, and I'm going to write a review on it in just the next couple of weeks because I wanted to have two months with it before I wrote a review. But I've been testing one that I've been looking at for kids, young kids, you know, when a family wants to be able to stay in touch with a younger kid, and for people that are older is the primary market for Hello Mobile. And I'm paying $5 a month. Five bucks is it. And with Hello, you got unlimited talk and text. And for five, I get a really, really limited amount of data. But the thing is, Most of the time, so many of us, and particularly young kids and older adults, we're at home or a place with trusted Wi-Fi, and we don't need to buy a lot of data on the backbone of a cell phone carrier. And so having a $5 a month bill is really great. So far, and I don't want to give a final conclusion yet, but so far I'll tell you the network has worked fine for me. And so That's the thing is being experimental, looking what else is out there, and don't just take it that Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, that their whole corporate thing right now is to push rates higher and higher and higher and higher and just expect you to pay it. You don't have to. The free market is working if you'll let it. Krista? Clark.com slash best cell phone plans. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that was the slug. for That's, That's the URL. Um, speaking, we don't call them slugs in I don't think the internet so. space. Okay. Is that like a TV thing? Maybe it is. I don't know. Okay. Well, speaking of monthlies, as yes. we call them, Jamie in Florida says streaming is beginning to blow my budget. Every time I turn around, it seems like there's another streaming service price hike. What can I do to save money on my streaming services? Any advice you have will be greatly appreciated. We've been putting a lot of effort into this in particular because the streaming service price increases are different than what happened with Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. What's going on in streaming is there was uh, like an 1849, 1849 was the gold rush, I think, San Francisco, California gold rush. Anyway, there's been that kind of gold rush mentality where everybody was trying to stake their claim. And the companies that produce content were overproducing content. They were losing billions, and they were trying to end up owning streaming territory where they could then be dominant. Well, they fought themselves into exhaustion, and now services are scaling back. 
merging out of existence, merging with someone else, being acquired by someone else. And the number of new original shows that are being produced each year is declining by quite a bit. And so the amount of content that's new and fresh that's going to be available is going down at the same time the prices of the content's going up because the companies decided they were done playing Christmas every day of the year for us with all this content they were losing money on. So we're now getting less for more money. So seeing this happen in the marketplace, we've taken steps to put together information how you can reduce the cost for the content that you decide you want and give you a variety of alternatives. One of them we have is how to watch everything you want for less than $100 a year. Uh, You may want other things, but trying to keep that bill down, ways you can get it done. And that is that slug you yeah, said we, URL. The URL. We have a streaming tool too yeah. where you can input the channels you want. But yeah, the URL is clark.com slash streaming. And the compromise that I have made in our household that has led to a revolt that so far <laughs> I have not been uh, overthrown <laughs> is I've converted streaming services to ad supported that were ad free and that's had the greatest impact on our bills. And so so what if you have to watch the commercials if you're getting the content for little? But my favorite is nothing. What's called fast television. Free ad-supported TV. And this is by far the fastest growing part of the streaming market where you get big, big, big libraries of content. And depending on the fast service you use, free uh, current channels, live channels as well, for nothing. Also, again, ad-supported. If it's free, it's for me. (laughs) Dave in Indiana says, I love when you talk about the checkoff list you use for your monthly bills. I just wish you'd stress how important it can be to anyone, but even more importantly, how easy it is to do. Whether on a spreadsheet or simply scribbled onto any little piece of paper, this easy task can save you from tons of confusion and headaches. This hack has saved me countless times. So uh, uh, just to summarize really quickly, we have transitioned in my household that uh, I'm no longer handling the bills. My wife Lane is, and she's still got a big analog side to her. So she has a trapper keeper like middle school kids like to have. And she's got a folder for every single bill we pay. And she tracks when they're paid, what's paid. And we can go through and look to make sure we're not double charged for anything, that the charges are our charges, that the expenses on our checking account are ours. And it's worked very, very well. And having, even if you're totally digital like I am, if you come up with a digital way to do this, fine. Or you can do something like my wife does, where it's done like it's 1970, and she has a a clear record of everything coming in and everything going out. It's it's been also for us a great budgeting tool because we've been able to see we're spending that much on this, that, or the other. It's been it's been wonderful for us to track our expenses and to make sure that the charges are in fact legit. Alexis in Texas says, my wife just and I just had a baby. Congratulations. Congratulations. And we are so happy that now we would like to expand and would like to adopt a child. I checked a couple of local agencies and the adoption fees are through the roof in the tens of thousands. I would like to know if you're aware of any agencies that may be more reasonable. So I've got two things I'd like to mention to you. One is that faith-based adoption agencies or religious-based adoption agencies, tend to be lower cost. And that's something you should look at in your area. The second thing is, I don't know if this would fit in your life, but to consider adopting a foster child, to start with a child in foster care who's under age three, who for whatever reason uh, the parents are not able to take care of the child, to foster to a young baby 
And then ultimately, as happens many times, but not all the time, you will be offered the opportunity at some point to do an adoption of a child in foster care who you've been taking care of as a foster parent. And the cost of doing so is very, very low, depending on the state, can be free. And while the child is in your care as a child from the foster care system, you actually are given an allowance for that child's costs every month. Um, The hard part of being a, a parent in the foster care program is many times you're going to have to hand that child back to a parent or a relative and that can just tear at your heart. But it is something that if possible, I'd hope you consider. I would also say if you work for, if you or your wife work for a, a co- big company or even medium sized company, often they'll have adoption benefits where that, that you're not aware of, where they'll pay a certain amount, maybe even all the adoption fees. The reason companies treat adoption that way is that they have very high costs through their health care program, through their health insurance, that they're paying for the birth of a child. And they will give often an equivalent benefit, sometimes even more, for the adoption of a child. So there are lots of things you could do other than paying at a retail adoption agency. So I I hope that you continue to feel this joy from having that newborn of yours and other kids that you bring into your life. Coming up ahead... I have good news from the IRS. No, I did not fall and hit my head over the holidays. I actually have some good news to share with you. So this past December, just like December of 22, we had question after question from people who had heard online that they were going to have a big tax problem if they received casual payments on Venmo Cash App, PayPal, Zelle, uh, anything like that, that exceeded $600. This was a lame, stupid thing the Congress passed a few years ago that was designed to catch people who were running a side business and just pocketing the cash and not reporting the income. The problem is so many people might receive money from a parent or a sibling or a friend or who knows who over the course of the year. They go to a meal with friends and uh, they're splitting the check and somebody Venmo's the money or cash apps the money or uses Big Bad Zell to send them money or anything like that. And so what would happen is under the, the brilliant law Congress passed, the IRS was supposed to require these payment apps to send you a 1099 and then you'd have to on your tax return account for it and if it was not from a business you were going to have to back it out and all that a nightmare administrative nightmare so the irs a year ago said forget about it we're going to delay it a year then they did so again is an early christmas present last month they said we're not going to enforce the six hundred dollars again Uh, administratively, we've not figured out how to do it, which means politically they knew it was lame and stupid to do this. So instead, only if you have money that is coming into you from one of the payment apps in excess of $5,000 will you get one of these 1099s. So let's say you're getting the money there and it's money from your parents, let's say. As I talked the other day, about, you know, a few weeks ago, actually, about that with two-thirds of parents giving money to adult children up to age 40, and the amount of money they're giving on average is about 9000 a year, then obviously you're going to have adult child after adult child who's getting these 1099s for having received this money. And it'll have to be reported even in the case of something like this where it's coming from a parent. And all you have to do is you report it and then you back it out with an explanation 
Um, I just made it sound easier than it is. But the reality is we do have a problem where there's a lot of income people receiving that they're evading paying income tax on. And this is a solution to that was really, really not well thought out. And ultimately, Congress needs to amend this or kill this in its entirety. And that will be up to the politicians in Washington who seem to have a lot of trouble getting things done. But it's something that does need to be fixed and not waiting for the IRS again next December to say when you file your return in 25 that you're not going to have to do this because, well, administratively, they haven't figured out how to do it. And today we have a special mystery guest <laughs> here to ask your questions. Yes. My wife, Lane, has stopped by. How are you doing? I'm just checking in on you. Well, it's great to have you here. <laughs> and for those of you who watch the YouTube show version of the podcast, you get to see my wife. Hello there. And it's great to have you here. And Krista asked you if you wanted to ask the questions for the second half of the podcast. I would love to. And I have a question. By the way, I talked about you earlier when you weren't here. What did I do? Uh, I talked about your analog system of tracking our bills and reconciling them and making sure they're okay I'm and how so well it old works. old school. Yeah, but I said that it was like you were a middle schooler with a trapper keeper That's with that thing. Like. It is like a, an adult trapper keeper. But you're able to make it happen. It works for me. So uh, you want to hit me with the first yes. question? Yes. Um, Mark in Ohio says, um, I wanted to send money to my daughter using Google Pay. I found out there's a limit of $500 a week unless I get a identity verification by giving a social security number. Is that safe? Um, it's as safe as any time you cough up your social security number. And this is not an unusual requirement from any of the payment apps. I didn't mention Apple Pay or G Pay. And so having to do a, basically identity verification when you hit whatever their thresholds are is something that is pretty standard. Uh, the risk to you, it is considered to be a legitimate business purpose and reason for the payment apps to ask for it just as if you go to open a bank account, you have to provide all kinds of identity verification. This is a version of that for GPay, and I would not feel too weirded out by it. Um, it could lead potentially to an identity theft issue, but hopefully not likely. All right, and we have Alex in Missouri, and Alex says, my wife and I are interested in getting a second car. I work from home, and I don't currently have a car. I just need something to get me around town for errands. Also, we're planning on having a child in the next two years. Does it make sense to buy an older car, maybe something for less than $8,000 in a model year between 2000, 2007? And uh, he also says, my wife is very concerned about how unsafe an older car might be and would like us to purchase something newer. So, Alex, I addressed this briefly before Christmas, and I want to reiterate that the deal in the marketplace right now is buying a used electric car for puttering around town. The range on them will not be good, but if you're just using them to run around town, They'll be much more modern. They'll have uh, far more safety features. The batteries are warranted typically for eight to 10 years. So you don't want to buy one that's way old because if you buy an, uh, let's say you buy an electric car for $10,000, the battery pack goes out, out of warranty. The cost of replacing that battery pack may be as much as you paid to buy the used electric car. But you will find that the, the electric cars are so cheap to run, and there's so few items that can break other than the battery pack, that I think it's a perfect second car for running around town for most families. All right, and we have Jake in Wisconsin, and he says, my wife and I are both teachers in Wisconsin. We're coming up on our 10th anniversary this summer. Congratulations. We haven't done much traveling because we have young kids at home. We'd obviously like to get the best deal possible. When do you suggest we start looking to book our first trip to get the best price? Do you have any 
suggestions on travel destinations that have a mix of being able to relax and maybe have some adventure. And also he says he loves the podcast. He's learned so much from you. Well, Jake, thank you for that. And uh, you will not be surprised at all by my answer. Uh I'm going to do the where first and then the when. Yep. Heard that. Do you know (laughs) where I'm going to say for adventure, for getaway, for several days? I don't. Utah. Oh, yeah, Utah 12. That's a great drive. Yeah, I mean, you go to Utah, you will have incredible scenery, unbelievable sightseeing, fantastic national parks. You can do, speaking of adventure, great hiking. You can do in the various mountain ranges. And often you'll find that the cheapest fares are going to be flying into Las Vegas, not into Salt Lake. And if you fly into Las Vegas, you're much closer to a lot of the national parks in Utah. And it will be one of the most relaxing, scenic, beautiful adventures you could ever do in your life. And my favorite national park is Capitol Reef National Park in South Central Utah. And uh, it is it is a wonderful adventure that I keep asking you, Lane, for us to go <laughs> on again and again and you don't we've, well it's because the the long car trips you just talk the whole time <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, anyway, i'm just kidding no uh, no we need to go fine. back and do it again that's fine <laughs> on the fairs you want to start <laughs> you want to <laughs> you want to set up a tracker out of milwaukee using like google flights or hopper or something like that where you're tracking the fares and they'll alert you when there's a, a deal on a fare from, I don't know if you're near Milwaukee or where in Wisconsin, fares obviously are cheapest out of Chicago, not as cheap, but also good out of Milwaukee and very expensive out of the smaller airports in Wisconsin. But looking, except for airports that Allegiant flies from smaller airports in the Midwest to Las Vegas, and so you'd have, you could even do a little time in Las Vegas at the beginning or the end of the trip before you go on up to the incredible scenery of Utah. And so uh, the key target period to look for fares, though, for summer would be March, April, would be when you're going to see sales start to appear most likely for summertime travel. And so, what's the name of the town that you love that's near Las Vegas, but it's to end? Oh, St. George, St. George, St. George, Utah. I would love to move to St. George, Utah. You just like the Costco there. Well, the Costco there was really interesting, but but uh, St. George is such an interesting place and beautiful culturally, it's fascinating. Uh, some other time I can fill in all the <laughs> cultural reasons, but the beauty of the red rocks in St. George and the blue sky that is illegally blue. Mm-hmm. It's like a painter who is a nature painter or scenery painter painted something that actually doesn't exist in the world. And then you get to St. George and you realize it does exist, at least there. And I, I just love that town. Thank you for mentioning that. Mm-hmm. So uh, that is my number one recommendation, Jake, for you to go there. And if you are going summertime as you are, Bryce Canyon and Zion will be intensely crowded. But the state of Utah has state parks nearby that nobody knows about, have pretty much the same kind of scenery, and you're there by your, not quite by yourself, but without the intense crowds. One of them that is near Bryce and Zion is um, Kodachrome State oh, Park. Kodachrome's one of my favorites. Kodachrome's really great. So the travel log part of today's <laughs> podcast is now concluded. I want to thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast, our first of the new year. Yes. And how about having yeah. a special Happy guest? Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Am I allowed to kiss you on okay, quick. podcast? <laughs> so have a great day. Remember what we're all about. Save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off.